Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for an MP webinar covering DOL updates, what to know in 2023. I'm Katie Kreider, Marketing Specialist here at MP. For those of you joining us on a webinar for the first time, MP is a full service human capital management company. We offer a complete suite of products and services to support organizations through the entire employee life cycle, including recruiting, HR, payroll, benefits administration, time and attendance, and compliance assistance. We support our clients with cutting edge technical solutions, as well as a proactive, reliable service and a deep HR and payroll expertise. At MP, we are wired for HR and help our clients succeed by aligning their people strategy with their business goals. I'm super excited to introduce your presenter for today's program, Kathy Hatfield. Ms. Hatfield's practice focuses on representing private and public sector employers in all aspects of labor and employment law. Ms. Hatfield's ex expertise in employment law includes litigating state and federal cases on behalf of employers involving Title IX, the ADA, the ADEA, and the New Jersey Law Against Discrimination, providing legal options and advice on personal employment and labor issues involving, but not limited to, the ADA, the ADA, the OSHA, OSHA compliance, the Fair Labor Standards Act, ERISA, the National Labor Relations Act, the Davis-Bacon Act, the New Jersey Law Against Discrimination, Wage and Hour, and the Prevailing Wage Act, and preparing personal handbooks and policies involving issues such as drug and alcohol testing and the leave of absence. Ms. Hatfield's lecture frequently on employment-related issues, including OSHA compliance, family and medical leave, workplace harassment, wage and hour compliance, effective hiring and retention, drafting employee handbooks, and workplace anti-discrimination law. Hatfield Schwartz Law Group is a woman-owned law firm located in Northern New Jersey with a practice-centered labor and employment law. Founded by Stephanie C. Schwartz and Catherine Hatfield in 2020, the firm provides dedicated personal attention to each one of their valued clients. Hatfield Schwartz was created with the mission to focus on client issues and determine innovative solutions with an unparalleled level of quality. They develop proactive business solutions, assisting their clients with all of their legal needs. For more information, including how to contact them, please visit www.hatfieldschwartzlaw.com. And just a quick few housekeeping issues before we get started here today. If you would like to submit a question during the program, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen and we will be sending out the recording of the webinar later today, along with a slide. So with all of that, I'm gonna hand the mic off to Kathy. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. I hope today you will find this presentation informative and useful in your workplace. Um, the, today, we're gonna to talk about some uh, developments out of the Department of Labor um, and what it means to employers and employees. We're going to review uh, the Department of Labor itself, and then we're going to talk about independent contractor classification, joint employment responsibility, and federal contractors and non-discrimination, and what's on tap for the new nominee uh, for the Secretary of Labor. So this chart shows um, the organization of the Department of Labor. Department of Labor is not one of the largest um, uh, departments in the federal government, but it is probably the most significant in terms of um, employers and employees. Uh, the Department of Labor um, is responsible for administering the Fair Labor Standards Act, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, or ERISA, the Family and Medical Leave Act, uh, the Labor Management Reporting and Disclosure Act, Uniform Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act, the Migrant and Seasonal Agricultural Workers Protection Act, the Federal Mine Safety and Health Act. Um, but today we're going to spend the majority of our time discussing the Fair Labor Standards Act and um, the one rule that has been uh, proposed by the Department of Labor 
um, concerning um, independent contractors and uh, the rule that was uh, withdrawn by the Department of Labor concerning uh, joint employment status. Um, Congress enacted the Fair Labor Standards Act in 1938 to eliminate labor conditions detrimental to the maintenance of the minimum standard of living necessary for health efficiency and, gener and the general well being of workers. The Fair Labor Standards Act generally requires covered employers to pay non exempt employees at least the federal minimum wage for all hours worked and at least one and one half times the employee's regular rate of pay for every hour worked over 40 in a work week. It also requires covered employers to maintain certain records um, and prohibits retaliation against employees. It's essential though that these requirements do not apply to independent contractors. And as we discuss throughout this presentation, uh, the term independent contractor refers to workers who, as a matter of economic reality, are not economically dependent on their employer for work and are in business for themselves. Such workers play an important role in our economy and are commonly referred to as different by different names, including independent contractor, self-employed, or freelancer. Regardless of the name or title used, the test for whether the worker is an employee or independent contractor under the FLSA remains the same. The new rule is not intended to disrupt the business of independent contractors who are as a matter of economic reality in business for themselves. So the uh, determining whether an employment relationship exists under the FLSA begins with the acts definitions. Although the FLSA does not define the term independent contractor, it contains expansive def definitions of employer, employee, and employee. Employer is defined to include any person acting directly or indirectly in the interest of an employer in relation to an employee. An employee is defined as any individual employed by an employer an employee is defined as to include, to suffer, or permit to work. The Department of Labor has said that the ultimate inquir inquiry to determining whether someone is a independent contractor or employee is whether as a matter of economic reality, the worker is either economically dependent on the employee for work, for work and that's an employee, or is in the business for themselves and thus is an independent contractor. This economic reality inquiry is designed to undermine an employer's classification of workers as independent contractors when they are in reality employees. For more than seven decades, the department and courts have applied an economic reality test to determine whether a worker is an employee or an independent contractor under the FLSA. There is significant and widespread uniformity among our federal courts in the application of the economic reality test, although there is a slight variation as to the number of factors considered or how the factors are framed. The factors include generally the opportunity for profit or loss, investment, permanency, the degree of control by the employer over the worker, whether the work is an integral part of the employer's business and skill and initiative. So what happened here? Um, in January of 2021, while um, President Trump was still president, the Department of Labor published a rule laying out five economic reality factors to take into account when determining who is an independent contractor. The 2021 rule uh, identified those five economic reality factors to guide the inquiry into a determination as to the employee's status. The five identified here include the nature and degree of control over the work, the worker's opportunity for profit or loss, the amount of skill required for the work, the degree of permanence of the working relationship, and whether the work is part of an integrated unit of production. The difference with this rule 
is that it stated that if the two core factors, which are number, uh, which are the nature and degree of control over the work and the worker's opportunity for profit, those were considered core factors that were considered most prob probative and should carry greater weight in determining whether someone is an employee or uh, an independent contractor. Those two factors were supposed to take priority over factors um, three, four, and five. And if those two factors uh, pointed towards the same classification, i.e. employer, uh, employee, or independent contractor, then there was a substantial likelihood that the worker's classification would be accurate. The Department of Labor uh, in October of 2022 um, took a look at this uh, January 2021 um, rule and determined that it would be appropriate to rescind that rule because they did not believe that the analysis was consistent with existing judicial precedent or the department's longstanding guidance um, on um, the determination of whether someone is an independent contractor or an employee. The Department of Labor believed that um, the appropriate consideration was all five factors uh, in determining a totality of the circumstances analysis. The department explained that the purpose of the old rule, the 2021 rule, was to establish a streamlined economic reality test that was supposed to improve on prior articulations described as unclear and unwieldy. It stated that the existing economic test applied by the department and courts suffered from confusion regarding the meaning of economic dependence because the concept, concept is underdeveloped has a lack of focus in the multi-factor balancing test and caused confusion in the, in the determination of the factors. The old rule explained that independent contractors are not employees under the FLSA and therefore are not subject to the act's minimum wage, overtime pay, or record keeping requirements. It adopted an economic reality test under which a worker is an employee of an employer if that worker is economically dependent on the employer for work. By contrast, the worker is an independent contractor if the worker is in business for himself. As I stated before, the 2021 rule identified five economic reality factors um, to guide the inquiry while acknowledging that the factors are not exhaustive and no one factor is dispositive and additional factors could be considered um, if appropriate. The D Department of Labor determined that the 2021 rule was inappropriate because giving primacy to only two factors really prohibited a development of the concept of economic independence and that the determination of economic dependence would be better accomplished by sharpening the focus of the, the five factors and determining whether or not the employee is actually in business for himself or in business for uh, an employer. By focusing on the distinction and, and the, the priority of factors one and two, the Department of Labor felt that it did not um, give credence to uh, judicial precedent or how the determination between an independent contractor and employee has developed um, through prior guidance. So what is, what is this going to do? Um, the new rule will apply 
the economic reality test and it will determine whether the an employee is um, a independent contractor or, or an employee. With this proposed rulemaking, the department describes the economic reality factors that reflect the totality of the circumstances approach that the courts have used for decades and provides an analysis, analysis as to how the department considers each factor in today's workplaces. And it is based on case law and the department's enforcement expertise. For example, the proposed investment factor is returned to being a standalone factor and considers facts such as whether the investment is capital or entrepreneurial in nature and considers the worker's investments relative to the employer's investments. Significant additional guidance is provided for the proposed control factor, including detailed discussions of how scheduling, supervision, price setting, and the ability to work for others should be considered when analyzing the degree of control exerted over a worker. And the proposed integral factor is returned to its longstanding departmental and judicial interpretation rather than the integrated unit of production approach that was included in the 2021 rule. This totality of the circumstances analysis considers all factors that may be relevant and in accordance with the case law and does not assign any of the factors a predetermined weight. While the 2021 rule aspired to provide a clearer test, the department stated that it believes on further consideration that the weighted analysis in the 2021 rule, which could have the effect of winnowing the test to those two core factors we talked about before, control and opportunity for profit or loss, sits in tension with decades of instruction from the Supreme Court and the Circuit Courts of Appeal, as well as the department's own longstanding position that no factor or subset of factors should carry more or less weight in all cases. Importantly, each factor considered in isolation does not determine whether a worker is economically dependent on an employer for work or in business for themselves. Rather, the factors are merely tools or indicators that must be analyzed together in order to answer the ultimate inquiry. This is not to say that a particular case, in, in a particular case, one factor may not be more or less probid, probative than others. This is to be expected in each fact-specific analysis. One or more factors may be more probative than the other factors, depending upon the facts and circumstances of each case. The analysis, however, cannot be cut, conducted like a scorecard or checklist. Thus, the economic reality factors help determine whether a worker is in business for themselves or instead economically dependent on the employer for work. Ultimately, in considering economic dependence, the court should focus on whether an individual is in business for himself or is dependent upon finding employment in the business of others. Economic dependence, however, does not determine or concern whether the workers at issue depend on the money they earn for obtaining the necessities of life. Rather, it examines whether the workers are dependent on a particular business or organization for their continued employment. Additionally, the 2001 rule stated that one of the reasons for the rulemaking was to reduce the overlap be between factors. In an effort to eliminate the redundancy, the 2021 rule limits full consideration of how the factors may interrelate or be more relevant in certain factual scenarios than others. The department now believes that emphasizing the discrete nature of each particular factor and evaluating each factor in a vacuum fails to analyze potential employment relationships in the manner demanded by the act's text and accompanying case law. Applying a formulaic or rote analysis that isolates each factor is contrary to decades of case law decreases the utility of the economic reality test and makes it harder to analyze the ultimate inquiry of economic dependence. 
Rather, the analysis needs to be flexible enough to work for all kinds of jobs, all kinds of workers, from traditional economy jobs to jobs in emerging business models. A multi-factor totality of the circumstances test provides the flexibility, which is why it has been used for more than 75 years to determine which workers receive the Act's basic labor protections. So those are the reasons why the Department of Labor uh, determined that it would rescind the 2021 rule and propose a new rule. The rule um, that was proposed by the uh, Department of Labor in 2021 under the Trump administration was designed to make it more easy for employers to classify workers as independent contractors. Um, there are significant benefits to employers uh, to be able to classify an employee as an independent contractor, including the fact that they do not have to comply with the Fair Labor Standards Act minimum requirements. Um, you don't have to pay um, employment taxes on those individuals, and it provides greater flexibility um, for uh, an employer in determining how to operate its business. Now, what is really the impact going to be? Um, we don't see a huge impact because um, as, as identified by the Department of Labor, um, employers had been operating under the, um, the economic uh, uh, test for decades. Um, and um, employers um, have relied on that test for decades in determining how they're going to classify their workers. The 2021 rule was not in effect for a very long time. And any employer who thought that they were going to be able to reclassify uh, employees into an independent contractor status um, uh, is um, only had the ability to do it for a short period of time because um, the new rule um, uh, was implemented shortly after the old rule um, went into effect. So um, in summary, the old rule, which allowed employers to simply, simply focus on two factors, um, uh, no longer exists and employers will now have to take account of all five rules when making classification decisions. So what should businesses do? Um, when they are entering into a relationship with a worker, carefully consider whether the worker should be properly classified as an independent contractor or an employee. We get inquiries all the time from um, our clients as to what they need to do in order to make an accurate determination of, of uh, an employee or an independent contractor status. Um, what we guide our employers uh, on doing is really look at um, who has control over that worker. Are you telling that worker when they have to work, how they have to work, where they have to work, all those how, what, where, when questions. And if you're coming up with a determination that you're controlling when the employee works or when the individual works, you're controlling how that person is doing their job, you are providing the employee with the um, uh, information and um, uh, equipment that they need to be able to do that work. Um, you are directing the individual's uh, job and performance. Uh, more likely than not, that individual will be a worker, uh, will be an employee. Um, in order to have a true independent contractor relationship, um, that individual needs to be able to direct how he or she performs um, job functions and uh, how that work is going to be directed. 
Um, and if you find that the individual is essentially doing the work when he or she can um, and has very minimal guidance from the employer, then you may have a true independent contractor relationship. Um, we would always recommend that if you have questions that you should consult with legal counsel um, when necessary. The second topic that we are going to discuss today has to do with joint employment. The Fair Labor Standards Act, just like with independent contractors, um, the Fair Labor Standards Act does not uh, define a joint employer or joint employment. The act does define employer, as we said, to include any person acting directly or indirectly in the interest of an employer in relation to an employee. And it defines generally an employee to mean any individual employed by an employer and identifies certain specific groups of workers who are not employees for the purposes of the act. Again, we've said before, employee is defined as to include, uh, to suffer or permit to work. In 1958, um, the Wage and Hour Division, which is a division of the Department of Labor, um, published a rule that actually introduced joint relationship um, to the Fair Labor Standards Act for the first time. The rule reiterated that there is a joint employment liability under the act and stated that the determination depends on all the facts in a particular case. It further stated that two or more employers that are acting entirely independent of each other and are completely disassociated with respect to the employee's employment are not joint employers, but joint employment exists if employment by one employer is not completely disassociated from employment by the other employers. The rule explained that where an employee performs work, which simultaneously benefits two or more employers or works for two or more employers at different times during a work week, a joint employment relationship generally will be considered to exist in situations such as one, where there's an arrangement between the employers to share the employee's services as, for example, to interchange employees, or where one employer is acting directly or indirectly in the interest of the other employer in relation to that employee, or where the employers are not completely disassociated with respect to the employment of a particular employee and may be deemed to share control of the employee directly or indirectly by reason of the fact that one employer controls is controlled by or is under common control with the other employer. This is important. This is an important con concept because if a joint employer relationship is found, then both and both employers will be responsible for uh, the um, requirements of the act, including overtime pay, minimum wage. Um, and those, those sorts of things. So what happened? Um, in January of 2020, the uh, Wage and Hour Division published a rule entitled Joint Employer Status Under the Fair Labor Standards Act. This rule became effective on March 16th of 2020. Um, the joint employer rule effectively rewrote that 1958 rule um, and it introduced the concept of vertical uh, joint employment and horizontal joint employment. Said for vertical joint employment, the other person that is benefiting from the employee's labor is the employee's joint employer only if that person is acting directly or indirectly in the interest of the employer 
in relation to the employee. The joint employer rule further provided that the definitions of employee and employee and employee in the act determine whether an individual worker is an employee under the act. The rule concluded that this language in the act by its plain terms contemplates an employment relationship between an employer and an employee as well as another person who may be an employer too, only which fit the vertical joint employment scenario. The new rule stated that four factors are relevant to the determination of whether the other employer is a joint employer in the vertical joint employment situation. Those four factors are whether the other employer, one, hires or fires the employee, two, supervises and controls the employee's work schedule or conditions of employment to a substantial degree, determines the employee's rate and method of payment, and four, maintains the employee's employment records. The joint employer's rule rules four-factor analysis deviated from a Ninth Circuit analysis, though, in several ways. First, the rule articulates that the first factor as to whether the other employer hires or fires the rule as opposed to whether it had the power to hire and fire is different from the old rule. This rule states that the potential joint employer must actually exercise one or more of these indicia control to be jointly liable under the act and that the potential joint employer's ability, power, or reserved right to act in relation to the employee may be relevant for determining joint employer status, but such ability, power, or right alone does not demonstrate joint employer status without some actual exercise of control. Second, that uh, 2020 rule changed the second factor, consider whether to consider whether the potential joint employer supervises and controls work schedules or conditions of employment to a substantial degree. This phrase is absent from the test that was articulated by the Ninth Circuit. In that case, that the, the court stated that the potential for joint employers exercised considerable control. The rule also stated that the satisfaction of the maintenance of employment records factor alone will not lead to a finding of joint employment status, but that Ninth Circuit did not provide that limitation. Finally, the March 2020 rule stated that additional factors may be relevant for determining joint employer status, but only if there are indicia of whether the potential joint employer exercises significant control over the terms and conditions of the employee's work. In addition to generally excluding factors that are not indicative of the potential joint employer's control over the employee's work, the March 2020 rule specifically excluded any consideration of the employee's economic dependence on the potential employer. Essentially, what the 2020 rule was designed to do was to make a finding of joint employer status much more difficult. The rule also said, because evaluating control over the employment relationship by the potential joint employer over the employee is part of the department's four-factor balancing test, it is sensible to limit the consideration of additional factors to those that indicate control. Again, as I stated, um, the uh, goal was to make the finding of joint employer status much, much more difficult. So what happened? In, in uh, July of 2021, um, the 
uh, Department of Labor proposed to rescind um, the joint employer rule that was um, established in March of 2020. And while there is no rule um, currently that, it, that has effectively replaced it, um, the Department of Labor um, is going back to a rule that uh, provides for joint employment when two entities are each responsible for ensuring employees' compensation is FLSA compliant. Essentially going back to um, the uh, 1958 rule. It, this is important because again, a finding of joint employer status is going to um, is going to make a determination as to whether both employers are responsible for uh, that employee and comply and making sure that they're in compliance with the Fair Labor Standards Act. So this is the old rule, the March rule, which considered four factors, the hiring and firing of an employee, supervising and controlling the employee's work schedule or employment conditions, determining the employee's rate and method of payment, and maintaining the employer's employment records. As I said before, the Department of Labor has emphasized that a business entity need not have actual control over a worker's employment in order to be considered an employer. It just needs the right to control in order for there to be a finding of joint employment. So as I said, um, the impact on employers is that there is the potential that business entities who work together in some horizontal or vertical fashion may now be liable um, as joint employers than they may have been under the 2020 rule. Similar to the independent contractor rule, the, the March 2020 rule on joint employer status was not in effect for a significant period of time. So most employers have worked under the 1958 standard and the rescission of the March 2020 rule should not have a significant impact on um, employers who had been operating in joint relationships under the uh, 1958 rule. Okay, so um, the another rule um, that has recently been rescinded by the Department of Labor concerns um, uh, the rule that uh, allowed a religious entity exemption for federal contractors and subcontractors. Prior to uh, December of 2020, federal contractors and subcontractors were required to adhere to um, the non-discrimination practices that are set forth in Title VII. Title VII um, prohibits discrimination based on certain protected cate categories, such as um, race, uh, religion, gender. Um, and in, uh, 20, in, in 2003, an exemption was added um, to prohibit um, uh, discrimination um, for religious entities. And, in December of 2020, again, during the Trump administration, the Department of Labor expanded the religious entity exemption um, to include um, employers who um, have religious observance and practice as religion, um, essentially expanding um, the religious exemption beyond uh, those um, religious entities who have traditionally been considered religious entities, such as, you know, churches, synagogues, um, and those sort to include 
uh, entities that um, engage in religious observance and practice and call it a religion. Um, it also um, included any entity that was organized for a religious purpose as a religious entity. So this expansion permitted those employers, those um, entities to engage um, in uh, discrimination, uh, religious discrimination, um, and um, the in, on March 1st of 2023, just about a week ago, um, the Department of Labor rescinded um, that expansion um, of the religious exemption and returned it to the status quo. So um, employers are only permitted to discriminate um, on the basis of religion if they are in that narrowly defined um, uh, group. So let's talk a little bit about um, what is happening in the Department of Labor now. Um, last month, the Secretary of Labor, Marty Walsh, announced that he was going to be leaving as secretary so that he could lead the National Hockey League Players Association. Sounds like a good gig to me. Um, but President Biden um, nominated Julie Sue, who is currently the um, deputy labor secretary to um, be the next labor secretary. Uh, deputy Secretary Sue um, has faced enormous opposition from all sorts of um, employer groups, including um, trucking groups um, and um, you name it. Um, she is uh, really, she's, she is opposed by um, a, a great many organizations um, because of uh, her, her very pro-worker um, stance. Um, there is a concern that if she um, is confirmed that she will engage in um, significantly um, more uh, pro-worker rulemaking um, and expand um, the uh, classification of um, individuals from independent contractors to employees so that they have greater protections um, in, uh, in and under the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, so we'll have to wait and see what happens with that. Um, not sure that that's actually going to move forward. Um, okay, are there any um, questions that uh, we can answer? I don't see any open questions. Okay, well, we seem to have gotten through that a little bit more quickly than I had thought we would. Um, and so if anybody has any questions, um, you can feel free to email MP um, and um, I will be happy to uh, respond to any of those questions. Awesome, thanks so much, Kathy. I appreciate your time today. Um, Thank you. <laughs> to learn. Um, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was just going to close this out. If you want to go ahead and give any last words. Uh, yeah, um, there is one question. It says, I believe I heard the exemption status thresholds and classifications are changing. Is this correct? Um, my understanding is no. Um, those classification and exemptions are um, not changing. In fact, um, the, um, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, just issued a decision, I believe it was on Monday, um, which um, upheld the current classifications. Um, it was a case involving 
um, an employer who was paying um, uh, an employee on a day rate basis um, and uh, a day rate basis, meaning that they got paid a certain amount of money each day. Um, and even though that, that amount um, added up to more than $200,000 in a year, because that employee had not been classified um, and placed on a salaried basis, um, the, um, uh, the, the employee could not be excluded from um, the Fair Labor Standards Act overtime requirements. Um, it affirmed, it was a unanimous, unanimous decision that affirmed um, the requirement that um, an employee be put on a salary basis uh, in order to be considered exempt. So I hope that answers your question. If, if it does not, please feel free to um, email me uh, after this and we can have a discussion about it. Um, the other questions here are um, have to do with whether the PowerPoint will be sent out. So I, I leave that to you, Katie. Awesome, thank you so much. Yeah, of course. We will be sending out the recording of the webinar along with the presentation slides this afternoon. Um, so you guys will all get that directly to your email. Um, again, we wanna thank um, Kathy for her time and her expertise. Um, so to learn more about Hatfield Schwartz Law Group, um, we'll put that in our follow-up email and making sure that we drop their, their website and Kathy's information. So that way, if you have any questions, you can reach out to them as well. Um, you can also visit our website at np-hr.com to learn more about NP's full service solutions for 2023 and more. Be sure to join us next week on our webinar on upcoming preventing wrongful termination and discrimination lawsuits, best practices, and legal advice. Visit our website to register and to see the full calendar of upcoming, ev of upcoming events and available resources. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon and have a terrific day.